Hello, welcome along. Today we're going to be talking about SEO. Ooh, ooh, it's exciting, isn't it? Do you get those phone calls uh, about between four and five every day from somebody in Australia offering to do your SEO for your website? So I thought I've been doing SEO for quite a few years and SEO is something that when you construct your website, it should literally have uh, SEO already built into it. And I call them search engine friendly websites. So I've had quite a big web presence and I've, a lot of the stuff I've done has been self-taught. Well, actually everything I've done has been self-taught, trial and error. I've pushed it a bit too far sometimes and you get your hand smacked on the internet and you learn. So often I have a PowerPoint and I run people through and give them a sort of an understanding of how complex search engine optimization is. So I liken it to having, say, like 10 glasses of water all lined up on the table. And you can choose to fill up one of those glasses continuously and have it overflowing. Or you can spread the filling up of those glasses over the complete 10 glasses. So every aspect of building and creating a website really needs to get the maximum out of um, search engine optimization. You need to make sure you write through to your domain name, the way your website is constructed, uh, the words that you use for saving files, the content you have, the amount of pages you have, um, linking within your website to your own pages. And so basically it's called the World Wide Web for a reason, and that's because it is like a web, and you want to link as many pages together as you can so that um, you can capture more of an audience. So for example, a typical website that I would create for a, say like a rental car operator would actually consist of 300 pages of information. So a lot of the knowledge I'm about to share with you is actually 20, 25 years old and probably doesn't really apply so much today when creating websites, simply because I would recommend rather than handcrafting a website from scratch, is you use a platform like Shopify or WordPress. And a lot of the structure is driven by those particular platforms. But however, if you're a, um, a big multilingual company, you would probably construct your own website without using those platforms. Ideal, like a bank or something, they would have to construct their own website and not use a format of a website that somebody could potentially understand inside and out for security reasons. So just imagine you've got 10 glasses of water and they're all lined up on the bench. And um, first thing, I really want you to focus on this. This is a saying that I call my own. Market what you do, not who you are. So for example, I'm an internet consultant. So I could have a business called internet consultancy. Would be better than me calling myself a brand name like Coca-Cola. <laughs> Not a very good example. So if you're in front of a computer, which you might be now, jump on there and search for SEO cloud, a word cloud, and up you'll find a picture with SEO in it, and surrounding it all is a whole lot of words associated to SEO. For example, top, uh, rank top, improve, visibility, tools, optimizer, Result, page, expert, marketing, strategy, ranking, search, score, optimization, enhance, guide. So all those words are associated with SEO. So if I were creating content for a website and I was an SEO specialist, I would make sure I used every single one of those words somewhere in my website. So the idea of a, a good website is imagine... What I used to say to people years ago, you walk into the library and you say, I'll give you a bit more of a background. I used to market rental car operators. And at one point in my career, I had 45 different rental car brands using my services. And I said, just imagine that every one of those rental car websites is 300 pages. And my client would come to me and say, look, I want to be in the top 10. And I'd say, who doesn't? So I used to say to them, imagine you walked into a library and you said to the librarian, I'd like a book on rental cars. 
She goes away and she says, oh my goodness, there's a million books on rental cars. I can only carry back 10 or 15 at a time to the counter. And these ones look um, like they have a good description and it's got the word that the client said in it, so I'll bring back all these books. Then the next person walks into the library and they say, I'd like to hire a car for my holiday. So she goes away and she comes, goes to the library and there's millions of results, but then there's only a few books that said hire car holiday New Zealand so because the book is titled that name it helps bring it up so when creating a good website don't just focus on rental car New Zealand but think of why somebody would come to New Zealand so for example I would think well most people who come to New Zealand are renting a rental car because they want to travel New Zealand so we spent uh, about two years writing a 130-page itinerary for travelling the length of New Zealand. So a lot of the inquiries that we'd get coming into the library were for people saying, uh, I'd like to know how long it takes to go from Christchurch to Kaikoura, or what sort of things can I do in Kaikoura? And they would be searching for holiday tips. So by including that information in your website, that doesn't distract from the service you're providing, you can actually get a lot more people coming to your website. So I used to specialise in sending um, what I call general traffic, not targeted traffic. So you'd go to a marketing department and they would say, oh no, you, uh, you need to be very targeted and precise. And we can really say that whole message on a one-page website. And I'd say, well actually I create a 300-page website. My web rental car websites, and this is back in 2000. In four, we were generating up to 500 to 700 page views per day, which is around about 300 people, because most people would actually only visit about two and a half pages of the website and then leave. And some people would say, oh, that's incredibly low. But I said, well, isn't it better to have uh, 500 to 700 people on your website and the targeted ones some people would be quite happy with getting 30 targeted visitors to their website a day and they'd get the bookings. But I'd say, well, why not provide a free information portal and keep people on your website because they're there because they want to find information. If you give it to them, over time you'll build up a relationship with them and then they'll all be enticed to make an inquiry because you provided some value. Anyway, so going back to the SEO word and all the words associated with it. So if I was marketing pink elephants and somebody come into me and said, look, I sell pink elephants, I would try to think of everything associated with pink elephants. It could be uh, a zoo. Uh, then it could be a whole lot of other animals that may be in the zoo. And then I'd put that content on the website uh, so that when somebody's searching for a zoo, up comes the zoo information, and look, oh, look at this, this is interesting, they have pink elephants. So I call that cross-referencing, and that's making sure that everything associated with your industry is mentioned. And keep with restricted, doesn't mean put the Greek alphabet on your website, but anything in your industry, market what you do, not who you are. Because in my world, content is king didn't matter how good or bad my website looked, if somebody was on it, I had already got that audience. I'm not here to win a design competition, but I'm here to get people to the website and make an inquiry. So content is king. So I used to get a lot of slack. Uh, I used to work for a helicopter company, and I basically got put out of business in a way by... Uh, other website developers would go and offer a clean, crisp, nice, shiny website that um, that would look better. And my website used to be really text savvy. So for the home page, where other people at the time when I was doing it was having click here to enter, I would actually have probably about three to four hundred words. One of those clients I was marketing was was doing around about ten thousand. Um, dollars worth of uh, helicopter flights a day from their website had a very um, wordy website. So I'll give you an example, I won't read the whole lot, but it was a company called Harley Services 
and they were in Fox, Franz, and at the time Kaikoura, and also Tekapo. So we had words on the website that read into a sentence, like uh, uh, um, Mount Cook, uh, Raki Mount Cook, we'd use it both. We'd have uh, freshwater fishermen, trampers, hikers, film crews, corporate groups, because these were the type of people that were hiring their helicopters. And then we'd have things like uh, New Zealand, we'd have Fox Glacier, Lake Tekapo, Haas, um, snow landings, flight scene, helicopters. Uh, we'd even have uh, planes, the word plane mentioned. And we'd get all those words and we'd make it into a readable sentence without being stupid, so it would sound good. And we'd try to use as many words, private charters, helicopter flights, the scenic. And that was a great way of getting uh, that librarian delivering our book every time. Because believe it or not, even though you think everybody will walk into the library and go, I'd like to go for a helicopter flight, the librarian goes, on oh, what location? And they go, oh, French Joseph. Uh, but if they said the Hast, and they didn't know French Joseph we'd still want the librarian to go away and get our book and bring it back to them. We're talking about Google results here. So another wee tip I can give you is having a good URL. Now, people don't know what a hyphen is. Now, if you're on the phone and somebody says, what's your website address, and I'll use this one, uh, scenic-flights.co.nz, people don't know what a hyphen is. So you could have a domain name that didn't have a hyphen, but the hyphen actually means it's a space. And it's telling the search engines that there's two words, not one. So if you decided you were going to do have a, a helicopter company, say so let's use Alpine Adventures, uh, they could have alpineadventures.co.nz. And if somebody searched for Alpine Adventures, their website would come up because they have the domain, domain name to match. However, people who are travelling in New Zealand didn't know who Alpine Adventures were, so they would be searching for scenic flights or helicopter flights, or plane flights. So by having a domain name that read scenic-flights.co.nz, Company of New Zealand, was a brilliant name at the time. Now when this company parted ways with me, um, the domain name, I used to own the domain names, and I recommended to them they went and got alpineadventures.co.nz and would piggyback that onto their website, and then they could print all their brochures and they didn't see the value in having the domain name scenic-flights until I'd set up the website and got it going. And then when they left me, they wanted that domain name. So I finished up selling that domain name to them. Um, and then they ruined it. It's a different story. But anyway, so a good domain name, if you, were, if you had a hunting and fishing website, I, I had the domain name hunting-fishing. If I were a hedge trimmer, I had the domain name hedge-cutter, because that was what was available. If I had a... Now try this on your computer. Search for NZ Electronics, because I have an electronics shop. And if you search for NZ Electronics, our website will be number one. But that's also the domain name, NZ-Electronics. If you were lucky enough to get a short domain name, so I like public speaking, and I've got the domain name talks.co.nz. Now I'm keeping that, because one day I'm going to find a good use for it, but because it's just one word, public speaking, if I had that as a domain name, I'd have to have it hyphenated. And if I thought, oh, I don't like hyphens and got rid of it, then I would remove the hyphen, and people you know, would just wouldn't look as good. So talks.co.nz to me is a better domain name than having public hyphen speaking.co.nz because it's a one word domain name. So I've got danny.co.nz and then I have deheck.com. So I had a New Zealand tourism website and that was called New Zealand NZ.co.nz. But if you're thinking about that now and you're typing that into a computer, you probably go NZNZ because you don't realise that when I say New Zealand in full, NZ directly after it, .co.nz is my website address. People used to go, oh, I can't get all that, and they would just type in NZNZ. So I got the domain name NZNZ.co.nz as well. And because I was a general site, all things New Zealand, I would the structure of the web page would be New Zealand NZ.co.nz forward slash accommodation forward slash transportation. And then the URL, which is a uniform resource locator, the URL isn't a domain name. The domain name is New Zealand NZ.co.nz. But as soon as I go forward slash and put another name after it, it becomes a URL. 
So you want these URLs basically identifying the page that you're sending people to. So if it did have New Zealand NZ.co.nz forward slash accommodation, you would expect that page to have content on it about accommodation. And it's another glass of water. Having a good domain name, having content on your page, and having images to do with that. So if that's lost you, you might as well switch off now because that was quite complicated. If you're thinking about um, SSL, that is where you type in, um, you go to somebody's website and it has that wee key at the top, or HTTPS, which stands for Hyperterminal Transfer Protocol, and the S um, stands for Secure. Now, if I had two rental car websites lined up together and one had a, a secure certificate and the other one didn't, the one with the S would outrank the other one because you, the search engines give preference uh, to um, websites. Now, if you are going to a big host, like if you go to dehec.com, you'll see I promote uh, WP Engine, which is the host that I use for my WordPress websites. They cost around about $25 each to host US, um, but they provide a free SSL certificate with each site that I have, which means uh, I don't need to worry about paying the $75 a year and getting some IT guy to set it up for me. So I just briefly talked about the structure of the website. If we flip back to the uh, helicopter company I used to do the marketing for, uh, when I first turned up there in Franz Joseph uh, back in 1997 and I knocked on their doors, I said they agreed that they would do a website with me. I thought, cool, I think I charged them something ridiculous like three, four hundred dollars $400, can't remember. And um, I said, okay, what's the name of your flights? And they said, oh, we've got flight one, flight two, flight three, four and five. And I went, oh, uh, okay. Um, I said, what's your most popular flight? And they said, oh, it's a snow landing. I said, okay. So I renamed the flight online to called Snow Landing, even though in their office they used to think of it as Flight 1. And then I said, and, and what do you do on the other flights? They said, oh, we fly around uh, the Fox Glacier and around Mount Cook. Uh, and then they have another flight that was, uh, they visited the Twin Glaciers and, and they had the, what they call a grand tour. So I renamed all the flight ones to names because just imagine if you're building a house and you're going to build it like everyone else does and have a foundation and you have Dwangs and you have cross members and you have, uh, you know, um, different things, uh, light switches. You could actually, when you're creating a website, you can actually rename different parts of the website so it matches... Um, the industry you're working in so for example every part of the website for the helicopter company i'd rename things to do with helicopters planes uh, locations and the same with the page names it was really important that the page names of the websites match the names of the links so much easier showing this to you on a powerpoint presentation all right going to talk about uh, file names and also capitalization of file names so when i used to take a photo in my ds7 camera it would uh, uh, give me a file name, something like DSC 00555561Z. Now, if I uploaded that image to the internet uh, and didn't rename the file name, then what would happen is if I search for that file name on the internet, I would find my image. So logically, I thought, well, why don't I rename all the images on the web when I'm creating or crafting a website? all the images are matching the same as the page name, which can be a bit time consuming, but it works. So for example, if I was doing an accommodation website and it was in Dunedin, I would have Dunedin hyphen accommodation hyphen 01, 0203045, if there was five images on that page. And then that accommodation might have a motel, so then I'd call it Dunedin motel 0102 and so forth. But with the helicopter company, the file names, the pictures that I was using when creating the website were renamed to scenic-flights-friends-joseph-glacier. And, um, and I would just do that to match the page. And then when the librarian's going away and getting that book about scenic flights, they're going, where are these? Um, here's a whole lot of books. And they're ticking the boxes. They're going, the images are matching what they've asked. The file names matching what they've asked for, the contents matching what they're asked for, and the website address is uh, asking what they are looking for. So that gives me another reason to go pick up that book and bring it to those people. 
And one point I'd measured that 10% of our traffic was coming from the images in Google Images simply because the file names were what people were searching for. But you didn't know that. So some simple etiquette rules when you're creating your website is don't use all caps. It's, it doesn't work. It's like yelling on the internet. And if you do a search for some common searches that you normally would on any topic, you'll find that all capitals don't come up in the results. So even though you might think, oh, I want that to stand out and use caps, very cautiously use all caps. And what I recommend doing is using style sheets these days. So always use proper English when writing your content. And then use style sheets to capitalize the letters because when the search engine looks at the crude or the unstyled text it will read normal text and then it will show in the search results and if you're not being in the search results it's a waste of time and years ago i used to say to people oh we need all this text on the website and they used to say to us oh it looks messy can we hide it and then some smarties would say well why don't we just make it the same color um, as your background color and we'll hide all the words at the bottom uh, of the page uh, don't do that anymore and don't do it back then just, and uh, broken links so when I'm creating a website my client goes oh let's let's make a directory and we'll link to um, Mount Cook and we'll link to Doc and we'll link to this and we'll link to that and those websites were continuously being updated and the links that we would link to if they weren't monitored regularly they would break and then we would have broken links on our page, even though we're trying to do a good thing and provide information. So what I would do is I would actually, if I wanted to link to someone like Doc and explain about the area, I would glean ideas from Doc's article on whatever, and I would incorporate that in the website. So I'd be a one-stop shop on the website rather than linking to other people's website that may... Because as soon as there's a broken link on your website... Uh, once again, search Google, find a website, and if there's broken links, they normally don't appear in the results. Uh, I will talk about um, not having the same titles on every page, uh, and you won't be able to see this, but uh, I did a search for Parliament, and Parliament had a title come up in the search results saying no title homepage, because the person who did the homepage for Parliament hadn't actually done any optimization when creating the page because they weren't focused on uh, search engine results and that's what we were doing. Uh, just a bit of etiquette, don't uh, go to chat rooms and plaster your URL, I learned that the hard way. Uh, I've managed once to get a thousand people looking at my website within five minutes. It didn't uh, generate any business and eventually I got kicked out of the chat room. <laughs> yeah. All right, and um, don't copy other people's content uh, not only because of the ethics but because the search engines look for clusters of sentences and if they see that it's the same as somebody else's content they will um, restrict um, it coming up in the results now I got quite tricky with this because you imagine I've got say like 20 tour operators and they've used my 130 page itinerary and I've used it multiple times on the internet. And what I would find is the internet would scout through my uh, content and only index two or three pages and ignore the rest. And then the other website that would use the same duplicate information, it would scout through that website and bring up alternative pages that the first one didn't bring up. So for a 130 page article, I could use it multiple times it wouldn't bring up the pages I wanted to, but it would be all random, but the whole website was indexed. So if I had a, uh, a lot of information about Kaikoura, for example, or Taupo, then if I had a domain name and it had something like Auckland, Taupo, um, then when people search for Auckland, Taupo, rental car company, because I had those three names in something, it would uh, actually come up in the results. But why I'm saying that really is uh, uh, if you're going to write something and you want to have a good hit, just imagine the search engines are a hungry wolf and any content they haven't seen before is greedy to them and uh, it will uh, be indexed and also if it's well written, totally unique. The search engines want that content and they'll bring it up in the search results. So when I did product 
um, marketing, we used to go to the manufacturer's descriptions and if we had the time, we would rewrite the descriptions to be, have our own flair and feel to it. And then also the other trick with content, if you know a product is about to get released, try to be the first person to get it on the internet because if everyone else's copies you, you'll dominate. So you get a little bit of a tip. So you can't see this, but I've got a diagram in front of me and it's got about... Uh, I think I grabbed 20 pages of a rental car website when the case I was talking about earlier was a scenic flight company. And that means that I can actually give the 20 pages, look at them as booklets, and each of those booklets can have unique titles. So using that uh, cloud, a word cloud, like I did at the start, you'd pick, say, scenic flights, and you'd try to find a word cloud, and then you'd find all the words associated with it, and then what you'd try to do is spread those over 20 titles and then you would use those titles for each of the uh, each of those titles for each of the pages of the website which means if somebody was to search using this as an example for charters south island new zealand that would be a book that the librarian would bring to the person and then they come back to the librarian and they say oh i actually would like um some information on the world heritage area on the west coast so if one of those books had that title in it then that would be delivered so for example for that particular book title that page of that website Haas Hulli, Haas Hulli Flights Haas World Heritage, Heritage Area West Coast New Zealand and that basically means if somebody was searching for Hulli Flights New Zealand Hulli Flights Haas Hulli Flights Heritage Area Hulli Flights West Coast that would help that book be brought to, to the person by the librarian. And then if you can imagine, that was just an example one title, but I've broken down 20 pages of the website, and basically... Um, so the rule of a title was I worked out there around about 65 uh, characters. So a character is also a space, and that was the room you had. So if you decided that, oh, why don't we just make the title look really nice and just have Rental Car New Zealand or scenic flights or helicopter flights and just keep it real crisp and clean then it's like getting a glass and only filling it up with a quarter of the water so when you think of it as 20 titles 20 glasses of water you want the maximum amount of words and you want a real shuffling of words so you've got a broad um broad sort of uh what do you call it array of words on the topic stay focused with your topic don't get too carried away so the idea really is if you were doing rental car in New Zealand, then you would think, how many different ways can I say that? You do a lot of research on that those, those that phrase. So travel New Zealand, automobile, uh, automobile hire, transportation, uh, what else could you use? Car hire, hire car. You, you might get a bit vague and start saying taxi or minibus or bus transport or trains but you could use them somewhere else because it's all related to transportation but you'd really want to pick out 10 top words and focus on trying to use rental car new zealand the most but surprisingly enough i did a whole website and we branded it out as car hire because in australia rental cars are called car hire rather than rental cars so if you're appealing to australian market by using their terminology you're going to get more traffic and that works. And once upon a time with content, you could actually use spelling mistakes. So I had great joy at being dyslexic and using uh, something like uh, accommodation with one C instead of two and or one M instead of two, and I'd spell it both different ways. And think about this. How would you spell the word bungee? Now, if you think about it, some people go uh, B... Oh, I can't even spell it. I've forgotten how to spell bungee, but I think it's... Um, B U N G Y B U G I don't know, but some people spell it with an I at the end, and some people spell it with two E's at the end. But obviously, New Zealand was quite unique with the word bungee jumping, so I would use that word at least once in one of the pages, and I would use bungee spelt uh, one way or the other and mention all three of them. Because a lot of European people used to come over here and they didn't know, first of all, English very well. 
So they would have a go of sounding the word out and they would spell it any which way or form. But we would get traffic from any way, all three ways. So just think about that. So as I said, uh, with your titles, the mega description, uh, when you're building most websites, they ask you for a, a sort of description. So let's say if I was writing a page of content about pink elephants, we'll go back to pink elephants, and it was about 450 words, which is a good size uh, page of content, then I want to summarize what that whole uh, page is about, and that's called a meta description. And normally anything like 150 to 160 characters is good. And imagine that you were doing a tweet, and you wanted to send a tweet out explaining to people what this page that you've just published is all about. And tweets are, well, I don't know if they still are actually, but 140 characters. So you kind of want to do the same as that, but that goes in the back end of the web page. And that's to basically say to the search engines, if you want to list my book, here's a summary about what it's all about. And that's a meta tag description. So you've got a title, that's one thing. So a title should uh, not really explain or anything. It should just define the book. Tell them what the name of the book is and what the purpose of the page is. The meta tag description is telling us a summary of what the content is. But both the title and the meta tag were the most important things when trying to get a page in the search results. Uh, Interlinking is really good. So let's say I was a, a podcaster. Oh, no, I got that wrong. Let's say I was a blogger, which I've done a fair share of blogging in my time, and I might be writing a series of blogs. Now, when I publish a blog, it gets traffic for the rest of its life. So if you were a blog writer, you could go back to a blog that was written six months ago and link it to a new blog. And because the search engines visit the content regularly, that's why they, they're called robots, and they visit the content, and they're looking for changes if you change your content regularly, um, then you'll get the benefit from it. So I call it marinating in the search engines, but when a page is published and it's marinating in the search engines, once it gets traction, then Google brings it up and gives it to the librarian to deliver to people asking questions on a regular basis. So once that happens, why not go back into old content that you've got sitting there and link it to your new content? You have to have a good bit of structure about it, but before you start doing a lot of marketing, always write out a sort of a business plan on the content you're going to publish over the next 12 months. And then, like I say, link it to the content that's already there because it's got continuous traffic. And, and that's what the internet's trying to do, or what Google's trying to do, is they're trying to stop people who are spamming, spamming and producing content and stealing their traffic. Especially these days, they want you to pay for the traffic. So as soon as they like you, then um, you know keep linking your content to your own content, and then you'll have a bigger web and you'll capture more people. Um, keywords uh, used to be a rule. I don't know if it still applies, but I used to limit the amount of times I'd use one word in a page. So if I were writing an article about scenic flights, I wouldn't. I'd make sure I didn't use the word scenic flights more than six times on a page. And if I do use it more than six times, it doesn't really matter as long as it reads well. Um, but the reason I did this is because anything after that was a waste of time if I was trying to fool the search engines. Oh, excuse me. Your need on a podcast is always good. Now, the other th rule too is uh, anything that takes you a lot of time to do when you're preparing your content, the search engines can identify that it's got human interaction. So they call it H1 and H2. And that tells the search engine on a mobile phone, like if you put in brackets your heading and, and it's, it will be called H1 and headings are normally big and bold so that tells every device to look out for the heading and H2 it might be not so bold but another statement underneath so, and then H3, H, H4 and 5 and they're kind of old fashioned font sizes in a way to you they just look like different size font but to the search engine it's actually helping them identify what parts of your content um, are and then they can list them in the appropriate areas so in saying that if you want to use italics and you want to use bold bits you can uh, use it in moderation use it naturally and uh, if you were to do a page I reckon each blog should be at least 450 characters up to 650 don't go too crazy if you're keen on fishing when you go fishing there's no reason to put too much bait on a hook so a blog should be precise, uh, it should have an opening, body and an end. Uh, I believe it should have anything, no more than maybe three or four 
images. Uh, each of the images file names should be um, the same name as the blog. And also when you, um, the alt text, now I don't know if you, the olden days you used to be able to put your mouse over a, an image and it'll pop up with a description telling you what that picture was about. So you want to also have those background words called alt texts behind the pictures and they should also match the file names. So now you've got a, quite a few glasses of water uh, full. You should be able to go along and wait a, a good couple of weeks um, search for your website and see how it displays in the search results. Now you can't see what's in front of me because this is a podcast, not a, a video. But I'm looking for a search result for uh, scenic flights. And for example, I've got a title that says Scenic Hullock Flights, Fox Glacier Friends, Joseph Glacier and Mount Cook Region. And then it's got dot, dot, dot because it was too long so they just chopped it off. But I've got that full glass there. I've got a full title and then it shows me the website address, which is scenic-flights, so it's current with the title. And then it's got a lovely description that says, Heli Services is an experienced helicopter flight scene company providing visitors with a diverse range of South Island scenic helicopter flights and private dot dot dot. And that's good. And then under there it's scooped out a few pages because it's been well constructed. It's, it's linked a few pages of our website underneath the listing. Uh, then below that I've got a result from my uh, business networking company and I've got it exactly right and it says Elite 6 Business Networking, meet new people, generate new business, exactly 63 characters so there's no dot dot dots and then I've got my website address and then I've got a well worded 150 character description of the website and I've noticed it's not even in the order that I've originally written, it's picked up short precise paragraphs and I've got about four of them in the description and it shuffles them around, which is hard to do. So I just really wanted to sort of give you a few tips about search engine optimization. Uh, there's two ways of promoting websites these days. One of them is uh, paying for your traffic. That means you go to the auction, so to speak, and you say, I want to come up when you search for the word rental car. Now, if your competitor is also doing the same thing, you'll auction off and eventually you could be paying up to $15 per click. Um, for the phrase rental car operator until one of you goes oh my goodness I'm not paying that a good example is the word loans now if you want to come up when somebody searches for loan you will be paying either from 10 to 15 dollars in America uh, you people were paying 40 dollars to be the number one person um, in the results for the word loan so that's what that's not SEO that's just spending a whole lot of money and if you're competing with these people who've got the big pockets, then they'll just happily take your small budget as well as taking their large budget. But if you have a well-optimized website and it's well-balanced and it's constructed good, uh, you know, healthy bunch of pages, and you update it regularly, you should endeavor to uh, uh, put an interesting trending blog. So look for trending information and then post a blog about it. So think about what's happening on the news at the moment and all the hype and the media attention. Then write about that. That's what blogs are about. They don't have to be relevant. They don't have to be a sales pitch. Uh, they shouldn't have information on them like saying things like, go to our webpage and have a booking and enjoy your holiday in New Zealand. It should just be, here's some information about New Zealand. Enjoy the read and we're passionate about traveling New Zealand. And if you come in here, I hope you have a great time. And never try to sell anyone anything on the blog. So the search engines have some sort of real cunning plan at measuring all that sort of stuff. Um, so they want good, honest, clean content. And if you provide that, and that's why blogging these days, right now, is very, very strong. And it's really important um, to understand that. Um, don't be so cunning you could put a tail on it and call it a weasel. You don't need to be. Uh, and these SEO companies that ring me up at four or five every day, um, they're just going to take your money to a certain degree. I hope that's helped. If you've got any questions, feel free to um, ask, and um, I'll leave you there. Next time I'll go through one of these other um, slides, um, uh, presentations, and see if I can share some of my knowledge, experience, and skills. This is Danny DeHeck. Thanks for listening.